Okay, welcome everyone. I am so happy that you all can join us for another lively discussion on um, investments and crowdfunding and Black women legal representation. I am the managing attorney of the law firm Elizabeth L. Carter L. Esquire LLC, sorry, uh, which is also the host of this interview series, which is entitled Democratizing the Securities Legal Space. And we are sponsored by Law for Ethnom Democracy. I am also joined by my law clerk, Shanique Ross, who is a three-year law student at John Marshall Law School at University of Illinois in Chicago. She will be assisting uh, myself with the Q&A portion of the interview, which will occur about 15 minutes um, at the end, um, at the end, or 15 minutes at the end of the hour. Uh, so we ask that you put all your questions in the chat and, in, and reserve them to the end, and we will address them at that time. So the purpose of this interview series is to expose the general public and law students of color, especially black women law students to the various opportunities that exist within the field of securities law. We're specifically highlighting black women within a securities legal space because black women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs and yet are the least likely to be resourced or funded um, and, and, and other resources by legal support, which is necessary for their business growth and sustainability. So it is important that these businesses have access to legal representation that is both representative and culturally sensitive to their unique funding challenges. So for this last and fourth installment of the interview series, I would like to introduce Therese May, founder of Covington May Law PC and Metamorphosis Financial. Therese is both an estate planning lawyer and registered financial advisor, something that you rarely see, and has an in-depth understanding of both securities law and tax law as it pertains to the financial markets. She uses her breadth of knowledge to help create savings and investment opportunities for individuals and families. Therese sees personal finance as an artistic pursuit and uses strategy-based financial education to expand her client's ability to play an active role in their own financial narrative. So welcome, Therese. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so happy to have you. So we're going to just jump. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm so happy. So we're going to jump right into some of the questions that we have here for you today. Uh, first and foremost, what is a financial advisor and how does it relate to securities law? Okay. Um, a financial advisor. That's a really good question. Um, the industry has worked very hard in recent times to try to put some definition around that term. You have basically three segments that work within the investment industry. You have financial advisors, which are people who are licensed to advise on investments in particular. You have financial planners who are primarily strategists. So I am both a financial planner as well as a financial advisor. I work on strategy first, how I work in particular is I, I develop strategies first, and then I come up with investments that I feel are feasible for that client once I develop that strategy. So um, that's been a source of confusion for the public uh, for many years. And I think that's probably why more people don't utilize the services of financial advisors mm -hmm. or financial planners just for that reason. So that's a great question starting now. Interesting. Excellent. So what, what, what is your particular approach to both financial advising and planning? Well, I'm a strategist first and foremost. My background is in finance. My background is heavily technical. Um, so for me, it's all about what the client wants to accomplish first. So I look at what they have available, um, what their priorities are, and then I come up with strategies. The, the math, I'm an applied math person. Um, I've always liked math. So I tend to focus on math-based strategy and then I come up with the investments based upon their time horizon, risk tolerance, all of the normal things that you consider um, when making investments. For example, one of the things that I've run into recently quite a bit, especially with millennials, is um, I hear them say, oh, I took my money out the market because the market dropped. And so whenever you hear something like that, um, as an advisor, I automatically know that that person's in something that's not suitable for them. Because mm -hmm. if you pull your money out when the market goes down, you're not in the right investment. Because what you're supposed to do when the market goes down is put more money in. So it's just the opposite mm -hmm. of what people think normally. Most people, when they deal with investments, they deal with it from a very emotional standpoint. Well, my clients, I teach them to deal with 
investments from a logic standpoint. When the market is down, we buy more. We don't come out of the market when the market is up. We stay in the market when it's up and we let it, we just ride it out, but we never invest more money than we can afford to leave in the market when it does go through the corrections. For and example. We, yeah, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead, example. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm saying that's just an example. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, because it sounds like when you're saying buy more is because when the market is down, it's cheaper, right? Absolutely. That's when you okay. want to buy more. I remember when the market, there was a market correction around 2000, 2001, that was a dot-com crash, I think. I've been through so many of them now, I can't even remember. But um, I remember I saw Ford stock shortly after that, like around 2004 for like $4 a share. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the time to buy Ford stock when it was $4 a share. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when it's $400 a share, that's when you should be a little more conservative, unless it mm -hmm. really has some serious growth potential, right? Okay. So. For most people, I think um, they're just the opposite. When the market is down, that's when they come out, and when the market is up, that's when they want to go in. Mm -hmm. So, so, you're, so I, when you, I teach clients not to do that. Right. Okay. And you just you actually gave an example of was it Ford that you just said the company Ford Ford stock Ford. yeah years ago right. four dollars a share I saw that I'm like wow let's buy some more of that. And so now those are more public markets right can you explain the difference between a private investment and a public investment such as what you're just speaking of stocks like what is the difference to a new investor how would you a explain new that? investor stocks stocks represent equity investments it is a um it is a well it's actually a security it's actually not real ownership i don't want to be too complicated here let me make it, let me just make it easy. A stock represents an equity investment. Uh, there's no guarantee with the equity investment. It can go up and down with whatever the market says that investment is worth at that period of time. Now, there are some mm -hmm. rules that you want to follow as an advisor. There's some real particular rules that I try to follow um, in terms of making stock investments, uh, recommendations to clients. You look at the fundamentals, for example, of that, that particular stock, uh, what, the, what the analysts are saying about it, um, and they have particular um, valuations. For example, it says, well, it, this stock is undervalued, so I'll buy it and hold it for five years or 10 years or 15 years, whatever that period of time. But basically, a stock is an investment that has no guarantees, as opposed to a bond. A bond is a debt investment. Um, you expect to receive your money back plus interest on a bond. Um, as opposed to a stock, you have no guarantees whatsoever at all. So they're very different types of investments, but they're both part of an important part of a, a balanced portfolio. I'm sorry about that, that doorbell. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I what? <laughs> okay. So Therese, what? So what? Do you help clients with? So the private investment. So there's a, you know, thinking of a founder who's starting oh, a new company. Oh, private placements. You did yeah. say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, private placement investments are for accredited investors. People who have a certain level of net worth and a certain level of sophistication. Um, I don't place private investments um, because my broker dealer, for one, um, is they basically prohibit it. Um, because the difference in a publicly traded investment and a private investment is the whole due diligence process that's involved. Um, with private placements, typically it could be, um, for example, some of the venture capital and some of those other um, types of investments, they're not publicly traded, it, so you'd not, you're not quite sure of the level of due diligence that has occurred on them. Um, it may be an attorney, for example, that's offering an investment on behalf of a client. It might be private equity, for example, but they're not as tightly regulated as um, public offerings. So I stay on the public offering side. My, my broker dealers, I have lots of licenses and my broker dealers don't like that. None of them have liked it. <laughs> so when so you say due diligence, recommend. When you say due diligence, what do you mean by that? Like when you say, yeah, there's the process no of evaluating there. whether something is what they say it is. Right, um, because you're an if advisor. They have these investments in this place, if they actually own this building, if these were actually their gross cash flows or their gross revenues, their accounting records, um, just everything that they have in their financial statement, just verifying that that's true plus more. If they say we expect growth to be 
400% in the next five years. I mean, the due diligence process is designed to ferret out all of the facts and verify everything that's in that offering statement. And right, so and you help with that. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? And you help with that process as an advisor and planner, the due diligence portion No, of I don't have to do, do the due diligence. Oh. My broker dealer is, is responsible for uh, vetting the investments that I recommend to the public. So I don't have to do that part myself. Right. Okay. So it's right. Big job. Yeah. Right. And okay. So there's a different of the reason they don't allow us to um, offer private placements for that reason. Got it. it okay. It's so a big job, and it's a lot of responsibility. If somebody, um, say for example, a CPA signs off on this, he says, for, "This is something very simple." A CPA signs off on financial statements for a company, and the company is going to be used. They're using that those statements to. Um, to make an initial public offering, you know, say, um, what was the company that, that had an initial public offering recently? I'm trying to think, Uber a few years ago was an IPO, right? Well, the people uh Oh, I think we lost her a little. Therese? least months. Teresa, I think we're losing you. Are you? You're listening. Are you listening? Okay. Right? Let me it's be right. it's better now. Okay. You mentioned it's Uber. Better. Okay. Oh, I was going out again. Oh, you lost that far back. Let me look at my signal here. Hold on. It looks like it's okay. Just a moment. Yeah, it looks okay here. Hold on. I've got. We're hearing you now. So I've maybe got just... five bars. Pardon me. Okay. I said you I've sound got, good now. I've got five bars, so it says it's okay here. I don't know what's happening, but anyway, before a company goes public, it's private, mm -hmm. and when it's private, there's due diligence done, but it may not be nearly as rigorous as what's required to go public. Okay, that's so. No. That's mm -hmm. the that's the main difference between a private offering and a public offering. Mm -hmm. And so I represent public offerings. Right. Okay. And so can you explain the difference between an accredited and non-accredited investor? Accredited investor, the numbers have changed quite a bit. Um, it used to be they had to have a million net worth outside of the, the value of their home. Mm -hmm. And then it's moved to 2 million. So it's somewhere between 1 million and 2 million. It just kind of depends. And then also they added a new, and, mm -hmm. a, a new parameter. They also have um, an income parameter now, because some people have income, but they don't have a net worth. You know the difference in net worth and income? You know mm -hmm. the difference, right? Okay. Yeah, but maybe so, you, okay. can, you can explain. Okay, <laughs> you can explain, well, though. You know, well, you know, I don't want, they, let me just say this. This could go on for days, what we're talking about right now, because it's a big subject. Okay. Yeah. And um, I don't want to overwhelm people with a lot of detail, but what I will say, um, accredited versus non-accredited, I did address that, right? Yeah. And you work with non-accredited, correct? I work with non-accredited and accredited. Okay. okay. And accredited. Okay. But it's just that my accredited investors, um, they don't, I don't make I don't make recommendations on private offerings. Now, if they request it, we can place them there, but I don't make the recommendation myself. Right, okay, That's got a, it. It would have to be what's called an unsolicited um, investment, or unsolicited trade. Okay, got it. And so how- because I, have, I have a restriction based upon my broker dealer, my mm -hmm. oversight. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. So how important is it that you're a lawyer and, and a financial advisor? I think um, a lawyer and a financial advisor is really important. Um, so what are some of the benefits, I should say? The benefits? Some of the benefits okay, of being a both, lawyer. Yes. Do I have some lawyers here who want to be financial advisors? Because that'd be wonderful. There I don't know, a, maybe. Well, it'd be nice. Um, it's tough to put the two together because the bars tend to not like it very much. Um, but hmm. I am seeing a change um, there's a trend now toward law schools offering LLMs and wealth management. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Have you seen that? Okay. 
No, I, I haven't. Think Texas, but that's good Texas enough. A&M has one. So a lot of the lawsuits are starting to do it now because I think they see the value in having that service. But basically, as a financial advisor, my job is primarily to help people build wealth and manage that wealth and hold on to that wealth as long as possible. Um, as a as an attorney, my job is to preserve that wealth for future generations to the extent it's possible. So there is a natural, there's a symbiotic relationship between being a lawyer and both a financial advisor. Now, of course, the conflicts of interest are huge, okay? Um, according to uh, the bar, because on one hand, you help the client accumulate the wealth, you understand the money, you understand the ins and outs of the money, you understand uh, all the things they can make, they can do with the money, plus you get paid on the money. Then you turn around on the other side, you become their lawyer. So now on the lawyer side, you get paid for being the lawyer too. And the bar is like, okay, now we got a problem mm -hmm. here. So I would say, I think it's very rewarding, but I think you have to be meticulous in keeping the two things separate. That's the way mm -hmm. I would say that. So if, for example, if I have a law client who wants financial advising, my engagement agreement says expressly when we do financial advising, that is that does not fall under attorney client privilege um, because that information from a financial advising standpoint is subject to oversight by my broker dealer. But on issues with regard to the law, attorney client privilege um, applies. So I have to separate the two things, mm -hmm. but it works very well for clients. Clients love it, but you have to mm -hmm. be careful from the, from the bar standpoint. Yeah. One, one other thing I was going to say, too, while we're thinking about it, because you brought this up, it's important in the Black community in particular to have Black lawyers that are both lawyers and financial advisors to the extent possible. And the reason is, these days, it's getting more and more difficult to accumulate wealth. And because there's been so much downward pressure on compensation on the financial, um, on the financial advising side, um, having being a lawyer on the other side helps to kind of balance it out where it makes um, certain clients worthwhile, whereas otherwise you would probably, from a financial standpoint, not um, you wouldn't be in a position to take them on as clients. Mm. If that makes and sense. How, and you mentioned that. No, no, it does. And then you mentioned, you know, the black community. How important is it that you're a black woman within the industry, and what are some of the challenges? Oh, there are lots of challenges. <laughs> okay. Um, I started in this industry without knowing any rich people. <laughs> okay, so that was crazy in the first place. Okay. Um, but I knew I loved math and I knew that I could use math to help people and I could help both my people as well as others. Now, I didn't get as many chances to help my people as I wanted to believe it or not. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I think Black Americans, we have a very complicated relationship with money. And I didn't realize it at first, but over the years, I've become, I'm more in touch with it. And I remember when I first started um, in the business, I had a, some interesting relationships, uh, some interesting this experiences with um, um, couples in the Black community oh, there's something going on with the internet connection. Okay. All right, I just got that note that there's something going on with the internet connection, but I do have you running on this other, so we should be okay. But anyway, one of the things, um, the biggest challenges in the black community is getting us to kind of work together. Um, the IRS, the government, they consider couples one person. Like when you file your taxes together, if one owes, they both owe. I mean, for all practical purposes, you're considered one person. But when it comes to financial advising, I would see situations where one person says, well, this is that person's money and this is my money. I'm going to do what I want with my money. They can do with their money. But the problem is if I put them both together, these people could save $50,000 a year in investments. So instead I have to take one, this one can save about 10 by themselves. And the other one says, well, I'm not going to save anything. And I think that has been the biggest challenge for me in working in my own community is the first thing we have to do is get comfortable with the idea that somebody actually can tell us something about money 
And because we're afraid to know about money as a general rule, I find that. And anybody wants to chime in, feel free. But it's tough because so much of our personality and so much of who we are is tied to our money. But we don't understand that um, there are other people that really can help us if we open up. And But it's tough to open up, too, because you don't even know who to open up to. So the whole issue dealing with money with Black people, my people, um, it's a complex subject. It really is. That's that's my opinion. But I've had a great deal of success um, on the other hand, but it is, it's a tough subject with us because so yeah. much of who we are is tied into our money. We're, we're afraid to tell anybody. Like we think we're the only ones who have 40,000 in credit card, the credit card bills, but a lot of people have $40,000 in credit cards. A lot of people have $150,000 in student loans. A lot of people have, have problems making their payments every month. I mean, lots of people. But for mm -hmm. us to say, I need some help, it, it, seems, it just seems to me to be tough for us to say, I really need some help with this. So on a related question, how common is investing within the Black community and how, how important it is that this group does invest? Well... I don't know how common it is in the community. I can only speak to my own experience, mm -hmm. but but I will say, you know, this is a hard question. Most of my clients are white, mm -hmm. and um, I try. I probably have some friends I need to have you talk to. Um, the the clients I have that are black are excellent clients. They are like some of my very, very best clients. They're the most conscientious. I think the big deal is this, Elizabeth, and I think this has to, it has how it has to be addressed. We have to educate people about possibilities um, because if we don't do that, they have these, these notions in their own heads about how this is going to work. For example, I had a client came to me. This is a great example. Um, she was administrator with the state of California. I think she made, and she made quite a bit of money. She made about 180,000 a year. Well, she came to me and she had, um, I think it was $84,000 in credit card debt. And I think the payment on that was something like, like 2,400 a month or something like that, I remember. Okay, so you've got a person making $184,000 a year. They've got $84,000 in credit card debt. Payment is $2,400 a year. And she says, Therese, I've got all these credit cards. They are really getting on my nerves. What do I need to do here? This is what we did. We took the $84,000. We refinanced it against the, house, against the house. We got a new payment of $600 a month. Are you following me so far? Mm -hmm. The old payment was $2,400. The new payment is $600. Mm -hmm. How much money do we now have to work with? Oh, um, you're better at math than I. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Over so 1000 Over $1,500. <laughs> let's say we got $1,800. Okay, <laughs> good. Now follow me. Follow. This is just an example of something. Okay, so we got $1,800. This lady is in about a 39, 40% tax bracket, right? So that means to take home that $1,800, 1800 say, let's say, let's make it simple. Let's say she's in a 33% tax bracket. It's much higher than that, but let's say she's 33. So to take home that $1,800, we take 1800 and we divide it by two because 1800 represents two thirds of what she made, right? If about a third went to tax, is that, is that right, Shanique? Shanique? This is out of my depth. I'm just here to listen. Is it out of your depth? Okay, <laughs> let me take make it simple. Okay. 2400 minus 600 is $1800. 1800 in after tax dollars means you had to make 9 8 you had to make $2700 a month to take home $1800. Is everybody following me? Okay. What did I do with that $2700 a month? I took it and ran it into her 401k and her 457. So 2,700 a month times 12 months. What is that? Get a calculator. Hold on, let me do that. <laughs> well, Therese, okay. wait, before you get too deep into the numbers, I guess what, what I really want to kind of get us to get at is, you know, because this sounds like some an individual with a, a, a somewhat amount of wealth, right? Um, how does oh, they someone- had, They had no money. All they had was a house. 
thirty. Wait, but let okay. me let me so sum how it up. Does, let me so sum it up. This way. That was thirty two thousand four hundred. So you so we went that from saving. So pre you took that that eighteen hundred and put it in her pre tax. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure she had a Roth too. So that's pre tax, but then it lowers her tax bracket. Exactly. She does her taxes. Excellent. See, we went from saving nothing to saving 32,000 a year plus some more. She's absolutely right. Now we actually ended up putting up a total of about 50,000, 40, it was about 48,000 a year for five years. We put up $300,000 in five years. Hmm. So that's somebody had 84,000 in debt and they were saving no money. Right, right. So it's very important then that you exist and that you are there to, <laughs> to, you know, to really, you know, like you said, the fear is there or even just lack of education or know-how that, you know, this is the service that the Black community could utilize and should utilize. Um, so it's good that, so how, how could you reach, I guess, more of the Black community? Uh, we talk about, there's a statistic going around now saying that 1.8, you know, by 2024, the Black consumption power will rise to 1.8 trillion. So how can, you know, someone like yourself or just how could we ensure that a significant amount of this go towards reinvestment into the black community? What does that look like and how, how could that be done? We need to, we need to have, we need to put to get, put our heads together on that because people have to be educated about money in order to direct it properly. If, if they're not educated about it, it's just going to keep getting away. For example, I remember some years ago, uh, they were talking about just giving everybody their social security in their hand and let them manage it. Now, I, I'm experienced enough to know that if you give everybody their social security in their hand within 30 to 60 days, the government is gonna have all that money back. Mercedes is gonna get that money. Uh, Range Rover is gonna get that money. Um, it, that money will not be invested in our community. That, that money, the velocity in our community, velocity of money in our community is probably not even one. Mm. Some communities, the velocity of money is, that money turns over 10 times in that community before it escapes. So we have to put our heads together on that, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. because it's really gonna require some education because the only way to change people is to change how they think about money to change mm -hmm. what they know about themselves and that so that they know that money is not me. It's a tool that I can use. What's the best way to use this? And who do I get the information about how to best use it, how to leverage it, how to use it for myself? Because your labor is the most important thing you have. And if you're not husbanding the gains from your labor for yourself, if you're just buying, 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 and this economy lives off of us buying, right? If we mm -hmm. stop buying, we would, this country would be in trouble if black people stop spending all their money. Okay. So, right. but there needs to be a balance. Yeah. Right? And I was going to say, we need to put mm -hmm. our heads together on that one. That's a big, yeah. One. But I mean, I, and just on this call now, I mean, the fact that you can help someone save $32,000 a year, uh, just from the financial planning side, then the question is, what do they do with that state, those savings? Right. Um, oh, so we, we got plenty right. of places. <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay, but the important thing is this too. You don't have to change their standard of living to move them forward. Mm. See, most people think that if I go to a financial advisor, they're going to take all my money. I never take anybody's money. I, I take only what I find. I tell them, okay, I find money. You tell me what you need and everything else I find, I save. That's the deal I cut with my clients. Mm hmm so they live well, because if you cut people too close, they can't sustain it. And for me, I do too much work for them to take all my work and throw it out, right? I do, when you work down and you sit down and you work on a client strategy, you vest yourself or I vest myself in the work that I do for my clients because I want them to be successful. That's like my number one goal is for them to be successful because if they're successful, I'm gonna be successful. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a partnership relationship. So the first thing we do is you tell me what is it that you need? And I and then you, once you tell me what you need, then I add to what you need because more than likely, you're not gonna list everything you need. And based on my own experience, I know there's gonna be some other things that come up. So I automatically put that in. And then I develop the strategy around what you need. 
Excellent. So how can an investor that comes to you or a client that comes to you with, and then you do those savings for them, how can you help them get involved with more community centered investments? Um, you know, those who may, that may have a greater impact in, in their neighborhoods or where they live and where they work. Well, you know, Elizabeth, you, you ask a lot of great questions and they are big questions with big answers. Um, it requires, it's gonna require a concerted effort um, because see, just educating a client on finances is a holistic type of thing. It's a holistic, just getting them to the point where they're really comfortable with it. Once you've gotten them there, then you can go to the next level. But I think in terms of empowering people to invest in their own communities, I think we've got to put together um, a systematic way of doing that. I don't think something it's something that mm -hmm. one person can do, I think, but I, I'd love to be a part of it. Okay. For sure. right. I'd love mm -hmm. to be a part of that effort, but it's going to require more than one or two or three people. It's going to, and your generation has done some really, really wonderful things. And I'm just, I'm praying that you guys are going to be the answer, but I'm definitely willing to help. Hmm. I'm definitely willing to, to offer my expertise in any way that I can, because I think it's important. And I think you have, you guys have the right idea. You mm -hmm. have, I think, let me just say this too, while I'm thinking your generation in particular is going to inherit a very complex system to manage. So when you guys are 40 and 50 years of age, you got to know something about money. If you don't know something about money, how to manage it, you're going to be at such a great disadvantage because you're already inheriting a system that um, I don't even know the word to say. I don't, I don't want to scare you, but you probably know better than I do. But um, it's, it's not stable. It's not sustainable as it is. Um, it's debt ridden and we've got a lot of problems. So um, it's going to be, I would say it's very, very important. It's more important than ever before, I think, in the history of this country that the young people now really do understand about money. And we need to put together um, a systematic way of delivering that information. I have some ideas about that, but mm -hmm. that's what I yeah. would say, Elizabeth. I can't, I wish I could say I could solve the whole problem for you. No, no, no. That's it's not, a big problem. Yeah, no, we are, like you said, we all cogs in the wheel. Um, okay. So, is it possible for one of your clients or an investor or you know investor coming to you to invest what they call you know socially conscious investing or investing oh, sure. all the time all the, the time public market? okay okay yeah, can you explain well, sure. what that is and and how could an investor go through you and ensure that you know what their money goes towards is something that's aligned with their values you know um that happens a lot i live in california so that mm -hmm. happens a lot um that's, you know, I have a few restrictions because I can't make a recommendation in public um, in a forum like this, because my broker deal is going to review this, this tape and they're going to say, Therese, you made a recommendation without knowing if the person, oh, no. I see somebody else knows what I'm talking about here, Brett, he's smiling, he understands. So there are, there are all kinds of rules about making investments, but I will say this, there are all kinds of great mutual funds that are socially responsible. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds okay. of stocks that are considered socially responsible. So if the person came to me and they fit the suitability requirement, I would have no problem making that kind of recommendation. But I'm in Cali Northern California, social responsibility. I mean, I hear that every other person that I talk to. So, oh, that's good. But that's good to know. That's good to know that yeah. public markets easy. allow for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Easy, easy, easy to do. Yeah, all the time. Not a problem. Okay, good. Now, how has COVID, what's happening with COVID, you know, the financial crisis has impacted your work? Well, you know, it's funny, um, and I'm probably not a good person to ask this question because my clients have been with me since I started in my 20s. So many of them have been with me for my entire career. They're like aunts and uncles at this point. Um, my clients are like, like friends, buds, you know, so it's a very unusual situation. Um, I haven't had, when the market crashes, and I'm scared to say this, I'm, let me, I'm going to have to knock on wood when I say it. I don't get one phone call when the market crashes. So, you know, they go, oh, yeah, Tree said that was going to happen. Oh, well, let me keep on going. So I'm proud to say that um, all my clients, I've talked, I talk to them. They're all happy and they're doing fine. So um, 
the one thing about having money, what it does for you, it provides options. So for example, I have some clients that live in some of the, the, the senior places here. Cause when I started, I specialized in retirement planning um, when I was in my twenties and people looking at me like, are you old enough to do this? <laughs> but um, actually I was a hot shot in my twenties and I'm not a hot shot anymore, but I was a hot shot then. And, um, and they said, okay, we'll take a chance on this baby she's doing. So my clients have been with me for a long time. A lot of them are retired. And the thing that makes me happy is that um, when they couldn't get out, they just got hello fresh. Oh, I'm not supposed to advertise, am I? Well, anyway, you know these, <laughs> you know these services where they bring the food to you and they've got everything in it. They said, oh, Therese, they call me and said, oh, I had some old fancy, whatever, you know, they have all these great meals. Anyway, they're living well. So they couldn't go out, but they just had food brought in. Um, they, they're, they're doing okay. So COVID has not impacted my clients. It's impacted my community more so than my clients. Explain um, that. Explain how has that impacted and, and how did you see the industry changing post-COVID? Um, the financial industry or the legal industry or which? Uh, the financial industry. And so you mentioned that your community has been impacted. Yeah, my how has my it been community impacted? is impacted. I've seen people who passed away die. Oh, you mean like, you know? okay, right, right. Yeah, my community has been impacted, but my clients have done very well. Um, right. I lost one client to COVID and he was actually oh, very well known. Right. He was with the Black Ski Group. Um, um, that, was, um, that was such a surprise. But other than that, um, I haven't, my clients, I haven't had any clients impacted by COVID. Um, what was your other question? We talked about, we know what's happening in the community. With COVID. Well, how do you see the industry, change the the industry? industry I think one of the things I think After that's COVID. come out of this is people, my clients used to insist on meeting in person and now everybody's happy to do it on Zoom. I think that's going to be one big change. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think other big changes in the industry. I think it's going to be more difficult. It might, in one way, it might be more difficult to get with people, but in another way, it might not. But this is one thing I do see that's different. Um, mm -hmm. The way I came up in the business, it was all about the relationships with people, talking to them, holding their hand, you know, seeing how their kids are doing. Um, 26 and 30s with my clients. And I, I think that's why I know them very well. I know them as people. I don't know them just as clients. I know them as video, just like what we're doing right now. Interviewing on, I think you're, I think people aren't gonna, that's one of the things I think. Anyway, I think that's one, but I don't see other than that, the way you meet people is gonna be, I don't, I don't know. The way you're going to have to connect with people is going to be very different. That's what I would say about the financial industry. Um, I'm not sure how long this is going to last. None of us are or personal touch in the process. I don't in this environment. I would have to sit down and really think about that. Well, because I saw so that. Mm -hmm. So well, the I way I that speak, the, okay, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say that I, I saw that, um, you know, in comparison to private versus public investments, there was, uh, there was an article saying that, you know, COVID impacted the public markets in a way, you know, where, you know, interest rates and, and stocks was dropping really, really low. Um, oh, in comparison to, the to yeah, yeah, the investment piece in, in, in comparison to the well, private more volatile. There's more, there's more volatility, but um, my clients have made money during COVID. During COVID? Okay, interesting. My clients have made money. But once again, we don't, yeah. we don't invest for short term. We invest for the long term. If you're going into the market, you need to be there for at least, at least five to seven. If you can't afford to stay five to seven, you shouldn't be there, period. Mm -hmm. End of story. So if you're pulling your money out when the market's going down, you need some help with your diverse, your portfolio diversification. You need to have some real asset diversification, asset class, not just diversification in terms of holdings, but diversification in terms of assets. Mm 
because like I said, I've been through everything you can name it. I've been through it. Let's see. I mean, I don't even want to put you through that. It's been so many. Yeah. So I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about what I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any more questions, mm -hmm. Elizabeth? <laughs> Yes, yes, a few more. Um, so <laughs> going back to the question regarding, you know, Black investment or Black community investment, um, okay. you being a Black woman, A, you know, being close to the community, knowing, like you just said, some of the reasons why it's not happening as it should, or especially with the consumption dollars being, you know, so high. So then the question now is, um, you know, what can be done to increase the number of Black women financial advisors or planners? More of you, Therese. How can we increase more of you? <laughs> you know, I, um, that's a good question. I talked to, when I was in uh, Chicago, I uh, worked for an appellate court justice who is now on the Supreme Court. And I introduced the idea of lawyers being financial advisors <laughs> to him. And he just about ran me out of his office. He's like, Therese, that's impossible. Well, I'm open to it. If, if somebody is really willing to um, learn the financial advising business, I'd love to be a part of it. A group of lawyers who want to do that. I think that's where it would have to start. Um, it's going to be challenging. Um, Finance and law, lawyers and finances tend not to go together very well. And um, I'm a financial person first before I became a lawyer, obviously. So it was a much easier transition for me. Um, but I would just say we'd have to put our kids together and move forward on that. If you know a group, if you've got 10 or 15 of us, let's get started. It's going to, it's not going to be easy though. It'll be, it'll be challenging because it's going to be different. But it would be right that question. Uh-oh, did working? you stop? Is okay. it working? Well, it was going uh, in and out, but we- working. Oh, it's going we, in and out. Yeah, but I think we caught the gist of it. Basically, mentorship and a group, establishing a group, uh, targeting, specifically targeting um, Black women. We, to be we'd have to. We, we'd have to, because it's an, it's an unusual combination. And even if you become a financial advisor, you've got to have experience to know how to address these markets these days. And somebody's got to coach you on this. It's, it would be impossible to learn this. Um, I came through in a time where um, it was a little easier. It was tough, but it was easier. It's, it, I think it's really tough now. Mm. Not impossible, but, but it would take a concerted effort and you would benefit from having experienced people working with you. So you know how to find clients, how to bring a client in, and how to address client questions, especially the more technical parts of advising. And then so much is emotional with people now. Mm. So is that what makes it more difficult is, is the emotional piece to it or what makes the markets different now than before? I think there's so much more trauma in the world now. I think people are bombarded with, um, you know, this, this thing that I noticed, this whole reality TV thing. I mean, when I was growing up, we, we, were, we were poor, but we didn't know it, right? Because I wasn't looking at people on TV with mansions every day. So I was happy with my little life and I just knew I had to get good grades in school and I had to go to college and I had to go to church and there were certain things I had to do and that was my life. Well, now we've got this pressure to be all these different people, like we're supposed to be driving this kind of car and live in this kind of house. So we're like 25 thinking we're supposed to have millions of dollars. I mean, I think, I think that's what makes it tough because I think people, when they listen to the media, the media has defined how they should look and be. And people are so stressed about trying to be what they, what everybody else says they should be that they have a hard time just dealing with who they are. Mm -hmm. 
And when you're dealing with your money, you've got to be willing to take a chance and lay it out and say, okay, this is what we got here. Like the other day, a very accomplished woman called me. This, I mean, this woman is bad to the bone, right? She's known all over, like all over California. And she said to me, Therese, I don't have a clue about my money. And she makes like 300. I mean, she makes a good living, right? She's like, I don't have a clue. What do people who make money do when they have problems? They throw, they throw, just put it on a credit card. They throw money at a problem, right? So it's not that they're stupid by no stretch of the imagination. They're really bright, but they don't have time, right? They just need somebody to solve the problem. And I think I'm so ashamed. And I'm like, why are you ashamed? She says, my finances shouldn't look like this, but this is the big deal. Finance, dealing with finance requires professional expertise, period, end of story. So you've got these people selling books that say, oh, buy my book and you'll be an expert on your finances or take my financial literacy course. We'll teach you how to balance your checkbook. That's cool when you're doing baby stuff, but when you get to real stuff like dealing with debt and how to accumulate wealth, how to build wealth how to make sure I don't make any mistakes for the next 20 years of my life so that I can have a decent you know, standard of living and I can put my kids through college and I can retire on time and I can leave something for the next generation. That requires real expertise. You're not gonna get that out of a paperback you paid $15 for or, and see, that's the big deal. So people feel so much anxiety about who they think they're supposed to be because who the media tells them they're supposed to be and they're not. So I think they have a word for this. It's called cognitive dissonance. Have you guys ever heard that term? Cognitive dissonance, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? It's like something you know you're mm -hmm. supposed to know, but you don't know. So you're like, let me act like I know. And so these, all of these behaviors keep people from getting to the truth. And I think we have been bombarded, bombarded by so much data that we can't find information anymore. Mm. And that's what we have to have. We have to have information, not data. We got data points here, data points here, data points here. Oh, CNBC said this. Oh, uh, Fox News said this. People don't know what all that stuff means. So my job is to make data into information that they can use and that we can apply it in their lives and they can move forward. And I think that's the biggest challenge today is getting through all of the stuff that people have to just dig through emotionally every day to get up to go to work. You, you've got all these things you've got to do. You've got to raise your kids. You've got to deal with your spouse. And you're like, when do I have time to deal with money? I don't want to deal with money. I'm just going to go shopping. I mean, I think that's what we're dealing with now, more so than ever before. I've never seen it to that level before. Like I see it now in my life. I call it the ostrich syndrome. It's like, I'm just going to stick my head in the sand and this is going to go away because I'm going to go shopping. <laughs> people so are you, stressed and, and you so right and you mentioned you know the literacy books especially it depends it depends on how far you want to go what, you, what you're really managing but what would be the, the best resource for someone uh, a black woman law student or someone else who wants to get more involved in the financial advising or planning phase what is the best resource for them to start off with I should say you should just have them call me no <laughs> The best resource is right, <laughs> linking and networking, yes. <laughs> you need to talk to somebody with some experience so they can get you started. Oh, this we, we, one of the things I would say, um, one, this is what I would say for sure. If you're a law person and you want to get involved in financial advising, one of the first things you should do is look into getting a certification in finance. Because that certification, just either, uh, see, I have what's called a charter financial analyst co um, consultant. I have a charter financial consultant's designation. I hope I said it right, CHFC. And I chose that one um, for my particular reason. I'll tell you why. But there's another one called Certified Financial Planner. Have you guys ever heard of that one? Certified, uh -huh. okay. Pursuing either one of those designations would be very, very helpful for an attorney because the things that you don't know, it won't teach you everything you need to know, but it gives you a great foundation to get started. And that's what I would say, if they're serious about it, I would start with that. You can't pick up one book and get that information. Right. But okay. if you seriously pursue advanced certification in finance, I think it's gonna give you a great foundation to move forward. 
Okay. And we're going to have, we're going to allow you the opportunity to give your contact info. So for those who do want to reach oh, no, out no, to I, you, I don't want to, I don't want to, but if okay. they contact you, they can do, <laughs> you, I don't want to just give it out indiscriminately, but I'm, but I'm saying the CHFC, um, and I'll talk about that too. The CFP is the certified financial planner, um, designation. And it's, it's, I forgot the name of the group. America, it's not the American college. It's another group, but the financial planning standards board, I think, or somebody like that does that. And they put you through, I think it's about eight or nine classes and you sit for exams. And so that you get proficient, at least you recognize what you're looking at. I got a charter financial analyst, a charter financial consultants designation, because I wanted to focus on estate planning and uh, there, and the state plan just made sense. And that particular designation um, is most helpful to me as a lawyer. So that's the reason. And I already had an undergrad in finance. My background's already in finance. So I didn't need the financial certification, but that one was helpful. And for attorneys, that might be a really good one to look at as well. Got it. Okay, well, we reached the end of our interview series. We can open up the questions to the last about five minutes to the audience if we have any. Um, Shani, do you wanna look at the chat or open it up to the audience? So, yeah. so far we don't have any questions, um, but I know Alicia had her hand raised for a very <laughs> long time. So we will let her speak. Alicia's and pretty smart. She's pretty sharp. I can already tell. Okay, Alicia, go ahead. Well, hi, my name is Alicia Kidd and I'm actually in the Bay Area. I'm from born and raised in Oakland and um, I'm currently, I own two companies, um, two wine companies. Um, one of them is actually, um, I'm doing equity crowdfunding right now. Um, we're doing a revenue model for our investors um, on WeFunder, we've raised about close to 75,000 in six weeks. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I have is, cause I'm more so on the future of investing, which I, I'm a big believer in stocks. I actually majored in finance um, in my undergrad in business. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, and it's, it's, not, it's more of a question comment. I've noticed that in the law and finance, cause at one time I wanted to be a lawyer and may still do it. I noticed that there was a lack of black lawyers getting into securities, particularly equity crowdfunding. And I know it's super new. All the attorneys I deal with are white, all of the advisors. And because I know a little bit of the lingo, I don't know everything, but I had to walk myself through my SEC papers. I did all of that on my own because of the journey, right? So the question I have is why is there not a black lawyers, because we got some that don't specialize in securities law that can get on this new wave of equity crowdfunding that this is where all the venture capital is going. And I see it. So that question about equity crowdfunding and investing in companies like mine, or just any type of company that is on these platforms, that could be tech, that could be food, that are the wave now that is the new way of social conscious investing. That's an interesting question. I think um, the two things that come to mind when you ask that question. One is, see, because I come through the more heavily regulated side of the business, mm -hmm. the venture capital for us is kind of the wild, wild west. Okay. Um, so you're typically not, you're lucky to see me on this side of the business, let alone on that side of the business, right? Somebody like myself. I think that I think about the black owned broker dealers. I know there's, um, there was Utendahl. There, there are a number of firms out of New York, black firms. They're, they've got one right there in Chicago, a big one. One of the largest ones. I can't think of the name. About of Ariel, it. Ariel Finance, Ariel, the black one. Well, Ariel is one. That's John Rogers' company. But there's another one. There's a broker dealer that has done a lot of business. Mm -hmm. There, I think they may involve be involved to some degree. Um, Elizabeth, do you know the firm I'm talking about? No, I do not. Okay, I, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. I wasn't thinking about it. But you've got about five boutique firms. Mm -hmm. That would probably be helpful with that, but I'm not sure they would do it at the crowdfunding level. There is May Davis Partners in New York. 
He funds uh, startups, venture capital. Um, he's not an attorney though, he's on the finance side. So now that you mention that, almost all the people I know that do, that are involved in venture capital, if they're black, they're on the finance side, they're not lawyers. Okay, but there's another reason too. There's a big difference in finance and law when it comes to the venture capital piece. See, the money is really on the venture capital side. It's on the money side, it's not on the law side. On the law side, um, it's just putting together documents. For the well, most that's, that's the part where it is very confusing. It's, it's not even confusing. Like I had to do a form C, right? With the SEC. Okay. But mm -hmm. like, if we were doing equity, like future equity with stocks or offering like revenue, then that's going to require, and I have a lawyer that I kind of work with, but it's okay. different where that, where our culture comes into play is because like, say, I think Elizabeth, she's the attorney that deals with that, right? Elizabeth, mm -hmm. you deal with mm -hmm. So like I when I deal with my too. Caucasian mm -hmm. counterparts, they it's just a level of familiar, familiarity. It's like how Jewish people work with Jewish people, right? Mm -hmm. It's that culture. You can, I can, it's just different. Like they don't see what I see and that's mm -hmm. the disconnect, you know? And so yeah. I think from another level, even if you're as an advisor on the financial side, working with wealthy black folks, if they come from mm -hmm. a certain, if they are the first generation, you're working with them, it's different when they're, they're working with a white male because that oh, yeah. person is totally different and i think that i just wish that more black lawyers and or financial people would look into um equity the barack obama 2012 jobs act type bills because there's a trillion dollars going into Available. that already and i'm in those conversations i'm mm -hmm. you know so i would just hope that people like yourself on an independent basis because i know you work for a company look into your groups talk about on the financial side of looking at portfolios and looking at companies there are black companies that are tech that are food and in tech that are raising a lot of money that have long-term sustainability and to advise your wealthy black clients and non-black mm -hmm. clients to mm -hmm. look into that model i'll i'll take that yeah. under advice we we're running out of time yeah Sorry. one thing I, I was gonna say we're running out of time but sorry. oh no i'm sorry i don't want i know and it's so lively we should definitely have we our need, part two i know i just want to say two. we do need to do that, that <laughs> that's on the agenda mm -hmm. it is on the agenda mm -hmm. yeah but i will say thank you alicia for that um and this is the point of the interview series is to do just that right is to highlight women black women in this space particularly because women like yourself black women entrepreneurs are one are the fastest growing group, right? And so you make a big point as to this cultural sensitivity, this this benefit of representation for your business, right? Uh, so I'm so happy that you uh, were able to join us today and provide that insight because that's the whole point. And this is what we want to iterate and reiterate that people like Therese, people like Renee from last week or Florence, our first interviewee, uh, you know, just really having us in the room and 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 to encourage other Black women law students to do the same. And I think part of it is just, I know when I was a law student, I just didn't know this was available or didn't see the connection with the black community, right? So mm -hmm. part, part of it, like Therese was saying earlier, we just don't know that this is for us. So I think that, and I think things are changing, having you on the call and witnessing and being in other rooms is showing that things are changing and, and having this interview series and hopefully, you know, to spread it far and wide so that others can see and, and, and understand that this is what this is for. Um, that we need to increase our representation to support our founders in, in a way that will increase in their business growth and sustainability. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so that's the whole point of this interview series. And all others who may have questions, definitely you can contact uh, me um, at all, like, social media, which is Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at ELC, ESQ, LOC, or LinkedIn, um, ELC, ESQ. Therese May is also on LinkedIn. Um, Therese May, her name. <laughs> um, so, and I'm, and I just hope to have these continue these conversations. We definitely can consider what that would look like moving forward. Because I would love to have Black women attorneys on my team, like literally, like to do just to consult with. You know, I just mm -hmm. in this area, yeah. so and financial yeah. people too. Like, yeah, so. no, it's important. She's right. 
I well, here we out. are. <laughs> you know what? You get so busy with life, man. Stuff gets by you. It just gets away from you. But yeah, Elizabeth, we have to put our heads together with Alicia. Mm -hmm. Yes, so let's do it. Alicia, you definitely feel free to contact contact both gave, of us. I gave you my information in the text and I'll find you on LinkedIn. So. Uh, okay, okay. Chani, you can um, grab it for me. So uh, it's 105. I know we have um, other people have other obligations. So thank you again for joining us on our last installment. We will be coming back um, again on our Black Capital Matters installment. So that should be interesting. We will be talking about VC and, and on the investor side as well as the small business side. So stay tuned and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.